Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. Question 10 and question 12 have been withdrawn. We will start with listed questions and I call Mr Robin Swan. Mr Swan for a question. Question number one. Minister. Deputy Speaker, and with your permission, I'd like to answer questions 1 and 14 together, uh, as they both relate to the same issue of budgetary pressures and possible consequences of continued deadlock within the Executive. So, Deputy Speaker, as members will be aware, the Executive agreed the October monitoring resource allocations on the 9th of October. I updated the Assembly on the outcome of this in my statement yesterday. The June monitoring round agreed resource deal reductions of 77.9 million, equating to 2.1%. An additional 2.3 per cent reduction was required to meet the 87 million cost of not implementing welfare reform. This has now been agreed. Through negotiations with Her Majesty's Treasury, I have secured access to the reserve in 2014-15 of up to £100 million. Uh, this has allowed the Executive to make allocations of £125 million to mitigate the worst impact of these reductions. However, this is uh, far from an ideal solution. It is most unfortunate that the intransigence of some in this Executive has enforced the need to call upon the £100 million facility. This would, uh, would, will make the 2015-16 uh, considerably more difficult because, in addition to having to cover £114 million of welfare reform savings lost to Treasury, we will now be faced with repaying an additional £100 million. Mr Swan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, can you clarify that the £7.6 million allocated to PPS will be used for what will, it, what will it be used for, particularly with reference to equal pay? Um, probably a, a question better, better put to me yesterday, um, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do my best, and if, if I if I've let, leave anything out, I will ensure that the member is, is written to and informed fully. Um, a pressure had developed up. Uh, there, was, there were two elements that, that fed into that over £7 million pressure within the PPS. One was to do with uh, casework pressures. Um, but the larger amount was to do with the resolution of uh, to settle in terms of pay a case which had been settled in the courts previously uh, in this year, earlier this year or late last year. Um, the co uh, so it became a, uh, a legal um, and contractual requirement and therefore inescapable, as, as indeed were many of the other pressures that were addressed in the £125 million allocation. Um, they weren't necessarily ones that you, we, we wanted to do or were sort of fitting in with the executive's strategy in terms of delivering programme for government targets. It was something that legally we had to do as, in this case as a result of a, a court judgment, Deputy Speaker. Kieran McCarthy for some. Deputy Speaker, would the Minister agree that in the long term tackling the issue of a divided society will be as, as important as uh, reaching a sustainable um, position on the welfare reform? I, I, I'm not sure. Well, I, I don't really want to be dismissive of the idea, notion, aspiration of uh, ending a divided society and having a more united and therefore more prosperous society in Northern Ireland. I think that is an aim that, that all of us uh, would share. Um, and whilst I think we all have to continue to ensure that we're making every, every effort that we can to meet that goal, um, I think that in the long term, it depends I suppose, how long the member would uh, define long term. He's, he's older than me, so long term might be longer than, than for him than it would for myself. Um, but you know, I, I think that in the immediate problem that we have is one that faces, faces around our, our budget, um, exacerbated, not helped at all by the fact that we are having to repay. And I know the member agrees with, with me in this regard that the penalties that we are having to pay, 87 million this year, 114 million next year, are creating a real present pressing problem. That's what we tried to deal with in the October monitoring round. Um, and whilst I think it is a noble and, and correct aim to try to end our divisions within our society, it wasn't as immediate and as, and as pressing as, as the issue of, of welfare reform in the context of this year's budget would be. But that doesn't mean that uh, members or myself or anybody else should be dismissive of, of trying to break down barriers that are costing uh, government in Northern Ireland money on an ongoing basis. Mr Datty Mackay. I'll ask him clear. Uh, the, the inescapables to which the Minister referred to today and yesterday uh, are no doubt partly in response to uh, a, a result uh, of the fact that the cuts got deeper and deeper uh, the further you got to 
towards the end of this budgetary period. Uh, in terms of his correspondence with the Treasury and his communication with, with the Treasury, uh, how has he pushed the Treasury to change its policy direction? Because it's quite clear that the Tories are intent on further cutting uh, our budget here uh, and further ensuring that the financial crisis that we do face looks set to continue. Well, you know, the, the member is right to uh, identify, and I haven't denied this and don't deny this and won't do it now, that our, our budget is facing a number of pressures. Uh, I have spoken at length in this House I have already about the, the pressures that not progressing with welfare reform is having. Uh, and no one in this House, no matter what their position in respect of the policy of welfare reform, can deny that it is having a, an increasing and, and uh, it is increasing from 87 this year, 13 last year, 87 this year, 114 million next year. And that pressure will grow and grow, and I think it's anticipated to be in excess of, certainly on uh, work that DSD has carried out, in excess of £300 million will come out of our budget in 2018-2019 if we haven't progressed well for reform legislation by that stage. There are other pressures. Uh, the member will be aware of pressures in respect of public sector uh, pensions. Uh, there are pressures that departments themselves are having. Uh, although he's right to point out that many of the inescapable uh, pressures that we have addressed they, were, they became inescapable because of the stage in the financial year in which we were taking decisions to trim other budgets to, to help to pay for them. Um, so they, yes, they were deemed inescapable, but the degree to which they became in, in, inescapable was exacerbated by our lack of taking, I think, a, a sensible decision back in June, which I recommended at that time, but the executive didn't endorse, which was to take the full 4.4% uh, out at that time. But the member is right that there are other pressures, and they include the fact that our resource budget has remained fairly flat, it has, it has risen, but in real terms, next year it is due to go down by 1.6 per cent, uh, and that presents a challenge on top of all of those other challenges that we face. And, uh, I am sure that my party's members of Parliament will ensure that Northern Ireland's voice is heard in Parliament, uh, and that where there is uh, unnecessary, unfair reductions to our budget that the uh, government in Westminster will hear loudly and clearly that that is not acceptable, and, and it was only uh, I would wish that others would perhaps join us in, in making that uh, that call in the appropriate place. Well, Mr. Ian McCree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And, um, can the minister outline what the potential implications are if the executive fail to agree a budget for 2015-16? The, the member is, is, is trying to lure me into a, a sort of a scenario that I don't really want to, to contemplate, you know, which is not having a, a budget in place for next year. Um, I suppose that there are, there are two um, ramifications. I suppose one is in the short term, uh, and that is that our, if, if member, members were, uh, the letter from the Chancellor of the Exchequer to the First Minister was shared with members yesterday, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's very, very clear. There is a condition within that that uh, we have to agree a credible plan and a balanced budget by the end of this month uh, if we wish to access the £100 million facility made available through the, the National Reserve. Uh, and I think I have made it pretty clear over the last number of days, certainly yesterday, how necessary that £100 million is to ensure that we live within our, our means uh, this year. Um, so, in the first instance, we need to agree a budget to ensure that we can access that money and all of those sort of hellish, nightmarish uh, scenarios in, in terms of cuts to public services can, can be avoided. Um, in the longer term, uh, I suppose there is a concern that um, the deadlock continues and we cannot, because, primarily because of a lack of agreement in welfare reform and the ramifications that that has for next year's budget, both in terms of penalties and indeed other costs. Uh, that we are unable to agree a total budget. Now, I remain optimistic that we, we can get a draft budget out the door, and I will be making every effort in the coming days and coming weeks to ensure that we do meet that, that deadline of having it agreed by the end of October. Um, there is a situation, of course, where uh, the legislation provides, I think it's 50, Section 57 of the, the 19, uh, or sorry, Section 59 of the 1998 Act empowers the Permanent Secretary of my Department to allocate uh, up to 95 per cent of the previous year's budget to the next year's budget, but I think everybody in the House would agree that that is a situation that we don't want to get into, where civil servants are making that sort of decision. Um, we should have the ability, we should have the courage to move forward with what will be a very, very difficult budget, but take necessary decisions in the coming days and weeks to ensure that we have a balanced budget and a credible plan to move forward on the basis of. Well, Mr. Dominic Bradley. Um, can, can I ask the Minister if he will uh, clarify 
uh, whether or not he intends to address the residual equal pay issues uh, within the uh, Northern Ireland Civil Service, and if that will uh, include civil servants who previously were with the Northern Ireland office. The member, Deputy Speaker, will be aware that there are, whenever I hear equal pay in civil service, there are at least two issues um, that are alive. One is uh, for those who are leavers, retirees, uh, and the member will be aware that over the last number of months, um, the department has been has settled that case with the union and is actively trying to uh, ensure that those who are entitled um, gain access to that settlement. That was, of course, changed by the, the, the number of years one ha was out of service, and it was the I think, Abdullah case in Birmingham City Council that was um, changed the, the, the legal position in respect of that. My understanding is, and I, I can't remember the precise figure, but the, the vast majority. Uh, there's a residue still of a, um, a number of cases that haven't been settled, but most have been settled. And we will be continuing to work over the next while to, to try to make contact with those who, who would be entitled to ensure that they get what they are in, entitled to. In respect of the other issue, which is something that has been raised with me in this House several times in respect of uh, former employees of the NIO and the, the police, um, this is something that the House, I think, knows that my position on where I want to uh, deal with that issue, I want to see the whilst there is not, and I always repeat, uh, the sake of, of or the risk of, of sounding like a stock record on this matter, that there is no legal entitlement for those people to access to the uh, the old or the previous equal pay settlement. Uh, notwithstanding that, I think there is a moral case. I have put a solution to the executive, which I think deals uh, with the matter in terms of addressing that moral uh, case that I believe is there. Uh, unfortunately, that hasn't found favour on all sides of the executive. To be fair, most ministers, including the. Uh, members' own party colleague and indeed other ministers, including party colleagues of mine, have contacted me and said that they are content with the solution that I have put forward. Um, unfortunately, the problem and the blockage in this matter rests with Sinn Féin, uh, who want a solution which, is, I believe, does not take uh, cognizance of the fact that there is no legal entitlement. It is a solution which, if we were to follow through with their solution, would be unaffordable to the executive and, uh, surprise, surprise, expects us to go off to London and ask for them to give us the money to pay for it. Call Mr Cattle Boylan for a question. Let hold question number two, please. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, uh, in, in Budget 2011-15, the Executive agreed that uh, the levels of domestic and non-domestic regional rates would be increased in line with inflation. For next year's budget, my department is working on the assumption that this policy will continue and the level of the regional rate for 2015-16 year will increase by the rate of inflation. Call Mr. Boylan for a supplementary. Gormagan, uh, last time I on, could I thank the Minister, but Minister, in terms of increasing their own local resources and maintaining their frontline provisions, can you outline any proposals for targeting local levies which will assist our budgets at this time? I think I, I think I know. I might be the only person in the House. I think I know what the, the member is, is getting at. There seems to be some confusion in different, different quarters. I suspect that what he is talking about is the executive taking on more tax varying powers which might, uh, might assist us in some way or another. Um, and again, I think I've been fairly consistent in coming to this House and saying that I don't have a uh, reflexive knee-jerk re response to it where I think that all tax varying powers should be, should be ruled out. Quite the opposite. Um, I think I've set down very clearly that the tests which I think need to be passed in terms of further tax uh, devolution to this Assembly, one, that it needs to be affordable, and secondly, that it needs to have a, a very clear social and or economic benefit to Northern Ireland. Um, on that basis, we have supported uh, the devolution and have gained the devolution of our passenger duty for long-haul flights in the past because it was affordable and it secured uh, our only direct uh, flight into North America. Uh, we continue to pursue, and I am, remain optimistic, that we will get the power to devolve corporation tax to Northern Ireland. And whilst that is more expensive than our passenger duty for long-haul flights, it is, I think, affordable and it does produce uh, the very clear long-term benefits of increased jobs and jobs that pay well in excess of the average wage in Northern Ireland. Um, in terms of other powers uh, that could be devolved to Northern Ireland, uh, my uh, department has undertaken a piece of work consistent with the commitment made in the Economic Pact, uh, in June of, uh, which was agreed with the Prime Minister in June of 2013. Uh, I would hope to have that piece of work and the conclusions contained therein with executive colleagues in the next number of weeks. But in terms of our initial uh, reading of that, um, it would appear that there aren't 
in terms of having very clearly defined social and economic benefits for Northern Ireland. There are no other taxes. There aren't many taxes available to us or ones that we might take that would have the same effect, the transformative effect that corporation tax would have or would pass that, particularly that affordability test. Call Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, if he has any plans to reduce or remove um, uh, anything from the rate scheme for next year? Uh, the, 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 member will, the member, and I'm sure the House will be aware that the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, which was introduced a number of years ago and has, a, has been extended uh, twice since, um, has uh, a shelf life, Mr. Deputy Speaker, where it ends at the end of this financial year. Um, I have uh, initiated and actually close to the conclusion of a review which has been carried out by the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy into the merits of the scheme and how it has functioned. And of course, that will then inform uh, any decision that I might want to make in the context of next year's budget as to whether we extend that uh, scheme any further. Um, so that, that is the only one which uh, I have to say is, is it goes. There's not a doubt or a question mark over it. I, I mean, I think I made it pretty clear that I think that there is merit for some type of scheme moving forward. Because if you look back on when the scheme was introduced, we were in the middle of the recession, and whilst we, I think, can confidently say we are in recovery now, there are certain sectors, including retail, particularly retail, that continue to suffer and suffer in particular parts of Northern Ireland. So there is a need, I believe, for for probably some sort of scheme to continue the complexion and, the, and the, the quantum of that will be something that the, the work of NICEP will, will help to inform. But above and beyond that, in terms of other reliefs, uh, rate reliefs that are there, there are none of them that are on the table in terms of um, being taken off the table uh, or being, being done away with in the next financial year. Mr. Patsy Miglow. Uh, I got to ask you on colleagues. We have slashed an as the Fragri Kimchihaha. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for his uh, comprehensive answers. Uh, could the Minister uh, provide us with some detail as to what assets he or his department have identified which could be used to realise revenue? Well, I don't have a, a list of, of all of the assets, and I'm sure if I had a list of all of the assets and I started to read them out, to the member would exceed my two minutes. It would probably take the entirety of the, the remainder of, of, of all question time and health questions as well. Um, Look, there, there, are, there is an active uh, strategy in place, an asset management strategy, which has been agreed by the executive and is taken forward uh, primarily by properties division within my department, but also in conjunction with OFM, DFM, uh, which is identifying on an ongoing basis those assets which are no longer required by the public sector and, and then looking at the best option uh, in terms of um, realising better benefits and, and, and accruing better benefits for the public sector, and that could involve selling those assets and getting a capital receipt. And sometimes it involves getting planning permission for, the, for, for an asset or a site so that you increase the value of it. It also in, involves decanting, and this is one area which my uh, uh, department has been very active in doing, where we're moving out of some leased estate that we have and, and going back into some of our own, sta own estate or moving into new offices which are better suited to modern work practices, and that is saving a considerable amount of money year on year. Uh, but that's something that needs to be continually uh, assessed and, and, and looked at on an ongoing basis because there are opportunities that will present themselves. But in terms of, of um, realising uh, benefits from asset sales, that is something the executive has, has actively pursued over this budget period, because the member will recall, Deputy Speaker, that uh, at the start of this budget period, it was our capital budget that was under, under real pressure. And we um, needed to sell assets to get money to invest in, in infrastructure. Uh, and that has, that has happened, and that will continue to happen where and when it's appropriate. Well, Mr. Ian Millen for a question. Yes, number three. Question number three. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I, I'd like to answer questions three and five together. The issue with the report on the impact of welfare reform in Northern Ireland commissioned by NICFA is not so much with the report itself, but rather with how the information has been interpreted by some parties. Indeed, NICFA itself has recently stated that the, at some £500 million of the much-quoted £750 million pounds figure uh, that will be taken out of Northern Ireland as a result of welfare reform relates to changes that have already taken place or which are outside the control of the Northern Ireland Executive. In addition, the NICFA report focuses only on one side of the equation. It takes no account of the potential impact of welfare reform on le local labour markets nor of the adverse impact of reductions in departmental budgets as a result of non-implementation. In order to provide some much-needed clarity on the impact of welfare reform, I have commissioned 
an independent review. The terms that are of reference for this have been drawn up by my officials and have been shared with the Department for Social Development. Mr. Millen for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister, has there been any, any cross-party agreement um, on the terms of reference of any research or of this research? Listen, as I pointed out, uh, Deputy Speaker, in my initial response, the, the terms of reference have been drafted by my department. They've been shared with the Department for Social Development. Um, whilst I haven't got explicit or particular uh, cross-party support for those terms of reference, I think that they are touching upon a range of subjects that I'm sure everyone agreed do need to be looked at, and they include the policy implications for the Northern Ireland Executive of not maintaining welfare parity, uh, an assessment of modelling assumptions that currently exist for welfare reform, an assessment of the regional economic impact that the proposed national welfare agenda may have, and that includes opportunity costs of foregone public expenditure due to penalties, uh, and it also looks at the additional consequences that might flow uh, from continuing to deviate from national welfare reform policy, including implications for IT systems and delivery of social security payments. Now, that's not all of the things that we'll be looking at, but I'm sure that there wouldn't be much dissent from any quarter of the House, as it, those are, are things that we should be looking at and we should be getting an independent view on. Uh, I was before the uh, Finance and Personnel Committee uh, some weeks ago uh, and was actually pressed by three members of his own party to do a piece of work like this. I shared with them that it was my intention already to do a piece of work like this because whilst the executive had spoken about doing a piece of work, uh, they hadn't actually been able to agree to take that forward. So I thought to help inform the situation that I should do that. Uh, I, I took the, the, the comments of the committee as an endorsement for that work because I think that, that we do need to have an independent review which helps better inform the situation, because there are a lot of figures floating out there, not least many figures being thrown out uh, erroneously by members of his, his own party. Uh, but the only f the figures that I know that are actually starting to really bite, Deputy Speaker, are the fact that every week that passes, £1.6 million pounds worth of public expenditure that could be helping people in Northern Ireland is not helping people in Northern Ireland because we are paying welfare reform penalties this year. And every month that passes, £7.2 million pounds is being lost to, to this executive. Stop. That is something I think that we cannot tolerate and needs to be addressed as quickly as possible. Call Mr. Paul Gervin. Thank the Minister for his answer. And, uh, in doing so, he has alluded to uh, a figure of uh, 750 million, which was bandied about by uh, the NICFA uh, report. Uh, how is and why is that figure much lower now? It, it, I think NICFA have been unfairly sort of tarnished with this. It was work, of course, carried out on their behalf by uh, people at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, however, um, the figure has got out there, uh, has been cited by many, um, and it has sort of therefore become somewhat authoritative. Uh, and it's very, very clear, uh, certainly in the last fortnight, uh, listening to various contributions on the radio, I have to say, but particularly that of, of Seamus McAlevey from, from NICVA, uh, that some have taken the, the, the full figure at 750 and thrown it out there as being the gospel truth in terms of what's being lost, uh, when it's actually the case, by Nick Vizzo's own admission, uh, that 500 million of that has already gone from uh, Northern Ireland's budget. And the reasons for that uh, are, are multiple, uh, and they're very clear. Uh, some have been passed through because of changes, Deputy Speaker, that took place at Westminster, where we don't have uh, any control of, and some have taken place because of decisions taken in this House. So I see the, one of the former ministers for social development is in the House, uh, and some of the reductions in our overall welfare expenditure are, are resultant from uh, a piece of uh, legislation that he passed. I think perhaps it was his predecessor who started that legislation. I, think I, I, was, I was chair of the committee uh, over the entirety of that period, but it went through um, whenever Mr Atwood was minister. Um, issues like the 1% uplifting of benefits, which was lower than what had previ previously been the case, have been voted for through this Assembly. Uh, and, and the reality is that in many cases, in those cases in particular, they were examples where this House voted for, and some of those parties who are opposing the passage of the current piece of welfare reform legislation actually voted through, or certainly didn't do anything to stop, those impacts on welfare in Northern Ireland from actually going through. So, in some respects, that £500 million out of that 750, and I'm not saying I accept all of the figures that are there, 
there is accountability Minister on the other side of the House for those reductions. Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I, I note your acknowledgement that the 750 million figure is over the four-year period and isn't actually wrong. But, Minister, in terms of the terms of reference for this piece of work, will they, they include the proposals that are currently going through Westminster in relation to changes uh, uh, with the, about childcare and, indeed, the cap, if you like, on welfare reform coming to devolved, or the cost of welfare coming to devolved administrations? So it's not just about the current cuts, but the future cuts. Well, if we knew what the future cuts would be, I think if we had that sort of uh, precise information about the future, perhaps we would go off and do the lottery at the, at the weekend. But um, you know, in terms of in terms of what has been what has been said by, uh, per, I'm sure that the, the members are alluding to comments made by the Chancellor in the last number of weeks. Um, I think they have to be seen in the context of being pre-election commitments or um, pre-election statements being made by the Chancellor. It will be interesting to see whether they survive after the next election, no matter who is in, in power. Um, you know, certainly those, those things are, are interesting. Um, they show that the future direction of policy at a, at a macro UK level in terms of welfare is one where there will be continued restraint on welfare. And, and that's why we have got to get our act together here in Northern Ireland in respect of welfare. We have already seen um, various ways of welfare reform legislation come through, many of which are having um, a difficult impact on people within Northern Ireland and um, came through in the last uh, mandate of this Assembly whenever her own party was in, in charge of the Department for Social Development. I think what, what I want to see with this piece of work is that the current problem that we are facing, which is causing budgetary difficulties, which is causing political difficulties as a consequence of those budgetary problems, uh, that we get an independent review and an independent assessment because there are a lot of figures out there, there's a lot of people saying this, a lot of people saying that. I think we need an authoritative independent review that hollows out the, the particular set of circumstances that we are facing now. now that is, the, that is the, the spirit in which the work has been commissioned. Uh, the work will be carried out independently and I hope that the figures that come, come forward from it and the conclusions that come forward will be accepted uh, by all sides of the House uh, because that's the spirit in which they're being, they're being offered as a genuine attempt to, to carve away through all of this morass of figures that are out there and people are, are clearly somewhat confused about what is the truth. Well, Mrs Judith Cock. Thank you, Mr. Um, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I say that it's disappointing that the former DSD minister hadn't been more proactive um, and actually brought forward some of this type of research himself, and that the current finance minister has had to step in and do his job for him? Um, how will the minister um, avoid this, um, this new research um, becoming an excuse for um, Sinn Féin and the SDLP further deferring a decision? The members somewhat unfair in our criticism of the, the previous social development minister, who, who did indeed uh, attempt to get a piece of work like this. And in fact, actually, it was uh, on a um, much higher level than the first minister um, suggested initially, some months ago, well before the summer, that the executive conduct a carry out a piece of work like this uh, to try to do exactly what I said to, to, to Mrs. Kelly to get a, a, genu a genuine uh, hollowing out of all of the problems that we're facing with the current. Um, piece of le welfare legislation, all the various economic, social impacts of it all, and the cost that was going to be had for, for the Northern Ireland Executive by not progressing. Uh, unfortunately, there was a lack of agreement um, from Sinn Féin to move forward on that piece of work. I thought that the, there was considerable merit still in doing that work, and that's why I have taken it on on behalf of, and it will, it will be obviously copied to uh, executive colleagues to help to inform their overall deliberations. In terms of the point that the member raises, in terms of this being seen as some sort of cause for, for further delay. I can um, assuage her concerns and, and calm her nerves in regard to that. This will be a short, sharp piece of work that will be carried out uh, on our behalf. Um, it, we have gone through the procurement process. The uh, people are in place and are currently doing the work. Uh, and I anticipate that it will take no more than four weeks. Uh, and therefore expect to have the report in front of me by the middle of November at the latest. So this is not something that's going to run and run and run and run and therefore parties who maybe want to procrastinate further can say, well, we're going to wait for the outcomes of this. This is something that they're going to have in their hands within a, within a number of weeks. Well, Mr. Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I am currently considering consultation outcomes before I finalise the arrangements for the scheme for next year. Our analysis to date suggests the funding allocated by the executive will deliver a scheme which will help everybody affected for a longer period than two years. 
I intend to announce the full details of the scheme in the next few weeks, uh, once my department has completed the overall costings to ensure the scheme stays within the budget set by the executive of £30 million in terms of rates revenue foregone. This work had to wait until the outcome of the non-domestic revaluation was known and will be completed very shortly. We have time for a supplementary uh, because that ends the period for listed questions. And we will now move on to topical questions. Uh, topical question one has been withdrawn. And I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Mr Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers today. As mi <coughs> Minister, I'm sure you're no doubt aware of the burden of business rates on businesses owners in Northern Ireland. That said, everyone recognises the benefits to businesses of the uh, empty business relief scheme. Can the Minister advise how, how many businesses have benefited from that, particularly in North Down? Um, the, the member is right. It, it is a, a deputy speaker an issue which, uh, no matter which town I go to um, in Northern Ireland, uh, traders um, and business owners are always raising issues around rates. Um, to answer the, the member's specific question, I am very pleased to be able to report that a total of 331 properties have benefited uh, right across Northern Ireland since empty premises relief was introduced in April of, of 2012. What that means in terms of uh, rate relief, Deputy Speaker, is that £1.367 million uh, has been allocated over the period to those uh, properties. And, and to answer the member's specific question, in the North Down, we don't have a by constituency, but in the North Down Council area, which uh, covers most of the North Down constituency, is just a little bit of, of ours, uh, where I live, which uh, isn't in there, but sure, we're, we're all going to be one big happy family in a number of months anyway. Um, it's 14 properties, uh, 14 businesses have therefore opened uh, since the inception of the scheme as a result of uh, that initiative that was taken by my predecessor. Mr Dunn for supplementary. Thank you. Thank the Minister for his detailed answer. Can the Minister give us an assurance that he will continue with this scheme? I think it's, it has been a very, I think the fact that there have been, Deputy Speaker, 331 businesses across Northern Ireland that have opened from it. And it's been, it hasn't just been small businesses. I think there's, there's maybe a, a view at the start that this was very much focused on retail. Um, it hasn't just been retail. It hasn't been sort of small corner shops or small retail units that have benefited. The, one of the best examples of there have been uh, cafes, restaurants, range of different businesses. Um, one of the, the biggest recipients of the benefit of this was uh, the Marine Hotel in Ballycastle, which we reopened last year uh, using uh, this. And there's a uh, welcome for that from the, the back benches. Um, and, and that has, and, and as Mr. Mr. Free would uh, testify, uh, has breathed a bit of life back into that part of Ballycastle. It has helped to uh, rejuvenate the, the tourism product in that, in that beautiful part of Northern Ireland. Um, I was able to visit a couple of, of uh, recipients of empty premises relief last week in my own constituency. And both businesses, and this is where I think we haven't, whilst the, the, the policy was about filling in vacant spaces in high streets and town centres across Northern Ireland, those two businesses that I were at, between the two of them, have taken on a total of five employees. So these are, yes, new businesses that are opening. They are filling units that were otherwise vacant, but they are also employing people in businesses and new businesses across Northern Ireland. So that being said, it is a policy that I think is working. Um, if we have a situation where retail is still suffering and there are still uh, vacant units across Northern Ireland in our town centres and our high streets, then I think it is something that I will want to seriously look at extending beyond uh, its life, which is due to run out at the end of this financial year. Mr William Humphrey for a topical question. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Could the Minister indicate what type of projects are being funded using the financial transactions capital this uh, financial year? The Executive Deputy Speaker has allocated uh, over £38 million of its allocation of financial transactions capital in this year, so that we have around um, 60, high 60, 70 million or so given the roll forward of, of some cash from, from last year, which we were able to take, take forward into this year. So we had around 70 million of financial transactions capital in this year to spend, and we've allocated uh, 38 million of that. The projects that are receiving that are the Agri-Food Loan Scheme, uh, the Northern Ireland Science Park, uh, GP and dental practices for um, some modernization work that they're carrying out, a, a range of housing schemes within the Department for 
social development and of course the, uh, the University of Ulster's relocation project to the member's own constituency in, in North Belfast. Um, and so there are a range of, of projects across different departments which are, are soaking up that £38 million so far. Mr Humphrey for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer and obviously welcome the investment there is in North Belfast. Is the Minister concerned that some of the FTC available uh, won't be spent? I, Mr Deputy, I, I, am, I am to an extent concerned that if we have a roughly 70 million of this year and we are allowed to carry forward, um, I think it's 5% uh, this year, or 10, 5 or 10%, but it works out roughly at about £5 million pounds, that we're able to underspend this year and not lose it in subsequent years and roll it into the next financial year. Um, so there is still, whatever way you cut it, there is still a sizable amount of financial transactions capital that is unallocated and we're nearly halfway through the financial year. Now, officials in my department are, are actively working with officials in other departments to try to get them to come up with schemes that could use this money in year. Uh, and that is, that is proving to be mixed in, 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 its, in its work. Uh, some departments are, are very, very active in coming forward with schemes. Um, others have yet to come forward with any schemes. Uh, and I would like to encourage, and I continue to encourage, as I do uh, frequently at, at the executive ministers, to open their mind to the possibilities that FTC creates for bringing forward capital projects that might otherwise not be funded from within their budget. Uh, and I understand that it's, it's, it's different, it's new, it requires departments to work uh, proactively with the private sector, which is not necessarily what they're used to doing in terms of the delivery of a project. But this is the way that an increasing chunk of our capital budget is coming. Uh, I think it will be a, an, uh, an active feature, an increasingly active feature of capital budgets moving forward. Uh, so if that's the case, and at the minute we're looking at you know, next year around 10% of our overall capital budget is going to be FTC, then departments are going to have to think up new ways in which that money can be spent. We are, as I say, working on a few projects which could take up the remaining allocations from this year, and I hope that we might be able to report some progress in the uh, remaining aspects of the October bond around, including capital allocations, which I'll bring to the House in the next number of weeks. Call Mr. Sean Rogers for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, is the 30 million set aside for rates convergence? Uh, is that ring fenced, or is it part of the budgetary discussions that are going on at the minute? No, it's you know the 30 the 30 million pounds. Uh, which has been set aside for uh, rates convergence, which was, and I think it, it's, it's probably worth, and I didn't get a chance in response to Mr. Kinnan, who was cut off in his prime earlier on, um, to knock down some of the uh, myths uh, and erroneous information that was put out in certain quarters of the media last week around this scheme. This was something that, you know, it was presented by particularly the BBC last week as something that had come out of the blue that we didn't know that there were going to be issues in terms of the converging of one uh, council with another, or in some cases three councils or four councils in one instance. This was something that was identified a long time ago by the executive and uh, Mr Rogers' colleague to his right-hand side, and his time as Minister of the Environment will call, that it was several years ago, I think it was 2012, whenever the executive first agreed that it would set aside £30 million for convergence, recognising that there would be an impact on convergence for, for some members of the public and ratepayers. Um, so it is money that has been set aside, it is in that sense ring-fenced uh, and won't be affected by any of the uh, issues around the budget that we are continuing to negotiate. Mr Rogers for a supplement. Thanks the Minister for his answer and as, as the Minister said this was agreed a number of years ago, was there any consideration that there might be a, a, a more money needed to smooth the transition at this stage? Has that been considered in the, in the budget discussions that are about to take place? It, it hasn't, it hasn't, although there is a provision within the, uh, the legislation, the local government reorganisation bill, to have a review of the scheme, I think, midway through. Um, my view that is more in the functionality of, of the scheme and whether it's working properly, smoothly, and having the effect that, that we want to have in terms of easing the uh, convergence of, of one rates bill with another or one le level of rates with another. Um, I mean, ov obviously, um, we would have to consider a totality of issues or crime and, 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 and funding will come up in that review. But we do have to consider that, of course, in the context of that will be midway through a scheme. The scheme is likely to be for three or four years. If you go two years forward, that's going to be in the middle of uh, a, very, a phase in our budgeting where it's going to be incredibly tight. 
and the availability of more cash for a scheme like that, or indeed for any type of scheme, is going to be fairly limited. Well, Mrs. Karen McKevitt for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the, uh, the Minister, in reference to uh, the letter from the Treasury uh, to OFM DFM on the £100 million bailout, um, can I ask the Minister what the process would be for that, given that there is a condition in it that it'll be have to, a budget will have to be agreed by the end of October for 2015-16? Can I ask what the process will be to that? Um, well, I could correct the, the member on, on one point. Uh, the letter from the Chancellor was to the First Minister. Um, um, but she is right to point out that there is a, uh, described as a condition in the letter. I, I don't think the, the condition that we, have a, we should agree a draft budget by the end of this month is a condition. It's something that is actually consistent. It's a condition in terms of our access to the reserve, but it shouldn't be a, an onerous condition for the executive, because it's something that actually we should have done several weeks ago, in my view, and it's something I have been pressing for from as far back as December of last year, when I first wrote to executive colleagues about what I thought would have been the ideal budget process leading up to, into the next financial year. Um, unfortunately, that ideal process got overtaken by a lack of movement around issues like welfare reform, which clearly inform next year's budget. Um, so we, I have been pressing, particularly since the return after the summer break, that we needed to agree not only uh, a way to deal with the in-year position, which we have now done, but we also need to agree a draft 15-16 budget, get that out to public consultation and have discussions then around agreeing a final budget uh, towards the end of this year or early in, the, early in the next year. That sort of timetable, I think, can still apply. Um, a lot of work has been carried out by my department to set up. Uh, the early stages of, of uh, a draft budget, there will be headline issues that we will need to discuss, um, and obviously the repayment of this loan is a factor which will now have to be considered in the light uh, of discussions around next year's budget. But I still, I think we, we would have been working towards the end of this month anyway to get a draft budget agreed. That allows us to go out to public consultation. That will help inform our, our deliberations around final budget, and we would hope to have a final budget in place by the early part of the next year, and that gives departments roughly three months then to plan for what is going to be a very, very difficult budget next year. Well, Mrs. McEvitt, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask uh, the Minister then what effect this is going to have on the programme for government? And if it doesn't work out, what is his plan B? Well, the, well I, I don't plan to fail, and I think we will, I think we will be. Uh, certainly the effort that I will put in, uh, the effort that my party colleagues will put in in the executive, uh, and as long as that is met by goodwill and, and similar effort on all sides, I think we can agree a draft budget by the end of this month. Um, you know, how, it, how next year's budget impacts on the programme for government isn't a particular direct responsibility for me, other than the, the various um, uh, targets within the programme for government that, that are directly related to the Department for Finance and Personnel. However, I do know that, uh, as I said on the, the programme board for, for the programme for government, that a mid-term review has been carried out in respect of the, the programme for government. Um, that will see some new targets introduced. It will also see existing targets extended to take light of the fact that, or to uh, be mindful of the fact that we have extended our term by one year. The budget does have an impact on that clearly because how testing you are with those targets, which are already in the budget, will be impacted upon by the, number of, the amount of resources that a department has. So if you want to stretch a department on a particular target, you've got to be careful, mindful then of the fact that they need money to achieve those targets. And if departments are going to take hits to their budget, as many will take next year, then perhaps those targets, as they are elongated, uh, shouldn't be stretched in terms of being more difficult to achieve. Well, Mr. Robin Swan for a topical question. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, County Hall in Ballymena uh, has seen the removal of the DVLA staff, could potentially see the removal of the North Eastern Education and Library Board staff, uh, planning division moving for local government. Has the Minister any indication about the future of the building? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't. Mr. Swan, for a supplementary. Would the Minister mind finding out, saying it's in the DFP estate? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have um, instant recall on, the, uh, on every building that has an extensive portfolio of properties that uh, my department is responsible for. However, um, given that the member has raised it, uh, and it is an issue uh, for him, it is an issue for the constituency and, and those who work in it, I will correspond with the, the member in terms of 
what the proposed future for County Hall and Ballymena is? Uh, topical questions. 